Greetings, everyone. Uh, this is Caroline Staten with Transition US, and thank you for joining another of our online events. And if you're first time to this, welcome. Our principal aim is to provide practical support to the leaders of transition initiatives, those who are considering starting a transition initiative, and community members far and wide working on resilience building within their communities. And I wanted to mention that we want to continue to offer the webinars at no cost, but do ask that you consider making a donation. And we have a donation button on the top bar of our website, again at transitionus.org. So thank you in advance to those of you who are able to do this. Um, so now I'd like to um, talk about our presentation today uh, with Janelle Orsi. And the topic today is Unstuck Economics, How Cooperatives and Community Enterprise Will Get Us Out of This Gigantic Mess. And uh, the description, uh, just I'll go through a few points uh, quickly here. Um, community supported enterprise plus cooperatives plus local investing plus social enterprise plus local currency plus micro enterprise plus sharing. These all add up to local resilient economies. So that's what uh, Janelle will be talking to us about. Um, her background is very interesting. She's a, an attorney, and uh, she uh, works at the, um, the, the Sustainable Economies Law Center in Oakland, California. And she's co-author of The Sharing Solution, a really great book. Um, the Sharing Solution, How to Save Money, Simplify Your Life, and Build Community. Uh, it's a practical legal guide to cooperating and sharing resources of all kinds. And uh, the Sustainable Economies Law Center that I mentioned is an organization that facilitates the growth of sustainable and localized economies through education, legal research, and advocacy to support practices such as barter, cooperatives, community-supported enterprises, sharing, local currencies, eco-villages, urban agriculture, and local investing. Um, so Janelle is known as a sharing lawyer, and her own law practice is focused on helping individuals and organizations share resources and create more sustainable communities. Uh, her legal services assist people to share housing, workspaces, and cars, and to form worker cooperatives, nonprofits, childcare cooperatives, co-housing communities, social enterprises, community gardens, and more. Um, and Janelle is also on the advisory board for shareable.net. Uh, today's call with Janelle will be approximately 75 minutes from its start to finish. We'll be hearing a presentation from Janelle, and then go into some Q&A. So without further ado, thank you so much, Janelle, for joining us today, and it's, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Caroline, and thank you, everybody, for being here. And I know that I think the majority of you have the handout, but I know that some of you don't. It's actually a pretty long handout full of cartoons. I initially thought this was going to be a webinar where I could flip through the cartoons, but I'm I'm going to just be sort of following along. You'll probably have a pretty good idea of where I am, but every now and then I'll let you know which um, slide I'm on. And um, so I'm, I'm starting out. You're going to see uh, one of the first pictures on the handout is uh, kind of a goofy photograph of me where I've kind of drawn a picture of my brain. So I wanted to start by talking about our brains because we all have them. And I think that our brains play a huge role in how we're responding to uh, the difficult situation that our world is in. And this is actually something that I learned when I was in law school. I took a course on mediation, and we were talking just a lot about how people respond to conflict or how people respond to fear. And I learned that there are kind of three major portions of the brain with three different functions. And one of them is our gray matter. And our gray matter is very useful. It helps us solve problems and come up with good ideas. And, and store information, and, and it's very handy. Um, and human beings all have this, um, which sets us apart from a lot of other animals. But um, kind of below the gray matter is, is something called the limbic brain, where we 
mostly process our complex emotions. Um, and then even below that, sort of at the cortex down there, is something that's also called the reptilian brain. And this is something that pretty much all animals have. Um, it's sort of our prehistoric basic instincts that um, are sometimes refer referred to as the four Fs. So it's fight, flight, feeding, and uh, for lack of a better word, I'll say reproduction. And um, these four Fs are, um, they're, 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 some, they're very powerful, I should say. And when they're triggered, and especially when we're afraid, when something scares us, the fight or flight kinds of responses are, are very powerful. And in fact, my mediation instructor said that studies have been done that said that when you are afraid and your reptilian brain is triggered, that it really kind of cuts off useful access to your gray matter for a couple hours. It sort of takes a while for your reptilian brain to calm down and get back to having good ideas and problem solving. That was a very useful thing to learn about human conflict. But I also think it's useful in thinking about how fear is causing us to get stuck in situations um, and, and kind of preventing us from coming up with and sort of in, engaging in solutions to the problems that our world have, our world is having. And, and we really, you know, we have a terrible situation in the world right now, and I think that's triggering our brains. We, we know about the economic tri crisis. We know that the ice caps are melting. And this is all really scary stuff. And, um, and, for, and it, it triggers my reptilian brain quite a bit. And, I'll, and the kind of response that we have when we learn that the ice caps are melting or when we learn that there's an e economic crisis, it's not so much, much fight. It's not like you know, we're being attacked by uh, a grizzly bear or flight, like we're being chased by a snake or anything like that. It's more of the feeding type of instinct that I think gets triggered. It's sort of feeding and hoarding. And I know that lizards don't. Um, I have a picture of a lizard here in the handout. I know that lizards don't exactly hoard quite a bit, but a lot of animals do, like squirrels and definitely humans. And, and I think that we've all been trained in this society or sort of enculturated to, ha to, to hoard, to accumulate wealth and, and accumulate a house and a car and all of these things that we think that we need and, and lots of money preferably. And that if we, have, if we can hoard all these things, that that will keep us safe. And, um, and a lot of us you know, have realized that the situation with the planet right now is that not everybody can have all these things because it would, of course, um, it would just dry out all of the resources on the planet. And um, so very few people can, in, in the end, on, on this planet, can really have all of those things that we aspire to have. And, um, but even knowing that, it can be very tempting to think, well, maybe I could still have it. And, um, and, and you know, even I think this sometimes, well, gosh, everything's falling apart, but maybe, maybe I could still accumulate wealth and accumulate a house and a car and all these things. Or, and even if it's not sort of the, the lavish lifestyle of, that you see in Sunset Magazine, I think a lot of us still picture, well, I still want a house and I want a, a huge garden where I can grow all my own food and solar panels. And, and we kind of picture ourselves accumulating enough stuff that we can kind of have this fortress where we'll survive the big crisis. Um, and, and I think that a lot of that is just our reptilian brain talking. It's, it's us being afraid of the future and just sort of th thinking that that's our only solution. And I have to say that it's not just coming from inside of us. It's also just the social pressure that's all around us. And I have this slide um, that sort of shows me and my reptilian brain being triggered because a lot of people tell me and this is friends, this is relatives, and so on. They'll say, Janelle, you, you really need to be charging more money to your clients. You should really maybe get a fancy office, and so you could buy a house and save money. And there's just this general thought that people who can't do these things, who can't um, make a lot of money and buy a house and a car, are kind of losers. And a lot of people feel like losers. That's just sort of what society puts on us is this expectation that if we can't do all these things, we're really way behind. And uh, sometimes even when I hear these things, even when I, you know, I'm somebody who's, I, 
I use a lot of my gray matter a lot of the time to try to come up with solutions and think about what a sharing world looks like. And, and it even triggers me. It even makes me afraid sometimes when people tell me, you know, you know, everything's going to fall apart if you're not accumulating wealth. And so, um, in, in society, we've, we've often been told well, we need to grow up and make a livelihood. And I have a few slides that sort of it shows the basic or a dictionary definition of livelihood that I found, which is it's the job that we have that gives us money to buy the things that we need. And, um, and so we end up in this cycle. We all kind of get stuck in this cycle where we need to have a job and we need to make money. And then we can take that money to the store or to our landlord or to wherever and buy the things that we need. And it's this sort of cycle of how we provide for ourselves. And we, we get very much stuck in this cycle. I think that a lot of people have started to be able to break the cycle on the end of, of where we buy stuff and where we meet our needs. And I, a lot of people have been more willing to stop patronizing the same old large stores or uh, you know, just to put their money into better places. But, it's, but the, the beginning part of the cycle where we have to get a job and earn money, the idea that we can ever break out of that cycle is really scary to people. Um, it's much harder to think what, what, what would that look like if we were doing something different. And, um, and that's because 92% of working adults um, are employees. And to be an employee, to, to have a job, means that, um, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times people are offended that I put it this way, but it, it kind of means that you're finding somebody else's wheel and becoming a cog in it. Because when you're an employee, and especially in the private sector, not so much in the public sector or nonprofit sector where things are a little bit more potentially democratically governed at the end of the day. Um, but especially if you're working for a for-profit business, at the end of the day, if you ask yourself, well, who is driving this business? Who's controlling it and making the decisions about what it does? And who's benefiting from it? So the profits that are earned, who gets those? Well, the answer is somebody else. And it took me a really long time to realize this, but when we let somebody else really drive uh, the work that we do and drive our livelihoods and somebody else is benefiting from those. Uh, I mean, we have no control over what these businesses are doing and, and how they're impacting the planet. And what we end up seeing over and over again is the wealth in society keeps accumulating with the same people, the people who own the businesses. And there's another really huge inherent flaw in, in the idea of jobs that are controlled um, by other people, which is that the job can just easily go away. And of course, that's why we have really high unemployment right now. It's this, this flaw is that, that jobs are designed to ensure that employers have enough workers and not to ensure that people in society have enough jobs. And so as long as we're going and working for other people, uh, there's no way to ensure that there's always going to be enough jobs for everybody. And in fact, the system, employers really benefit when there aren't enough jobs for everybody because they, um, they really have an edge in the job market um, as far as hiring. And of course, now we have a lot of people who are unemployed probably feeling really terrible about themselves, really depressed. I mean, the situation is terrible for a lot of people who are unemployed right now. And, and then there will be these kind of patronizing voices in their world, or they'll hear it on the radio, or some friends or relatives will tell them, well, you know, don't worry about it. Just you know, work on your resume and practice your job interview skills, and, and you'll get a job. But the thing is, there's just not, you know, if people are practicing their interview skills and working on their resumes, it's not going to create more jobs. There are still going to be people who are losing in this situation. And um, so it's really not the best piece of advice. You know, there's also this other voice that will say, well, you could start a business. Oh, but then they're going to say, maybe. But starting a business is only for some personalities. And I've always heard people say that, but it, you know, because I started a business, and, and I'm always encouraging other people to start law practices or other kinds of businesses. And they'll say, well, no, starting a business is really only for some personalities. And, and I wonder, well, why do people say that? And you know, one, on one hand, I, really, I realize that they're right. Because if you try to start a business in this world that we're living in now, where there are huge businesses, where there's giant corporations, and if you're trying to be a new company within that setting, it's so hard to compete. It's so hard to, to get to a scale where you could actually 
uh, effectively compete. And and you really have to, to to succeed. You really have to pretend that you're really important. You have to put on a suit. You have to drive out the competition. You have to grow, grow, grow your business. And most people don't have that kind of personality. And we should be grateful that most people don't have that kind of personality. And I think most of us don't want to be that kind of person, which is good. Um, but um, but it, it makes it really hard. I'm going to talk about, well, what does business look like? What does enterprise look like in, in a new economy? But um, I was just talking about, you know, and this is how we make our livelihoods, our jobs. But there's also the picture of where we're buying stuff. And, and for the most part, you know, people do – people have yet to really question – most people in society have yet to really question the, the importance of, the, of our decision of where we're buying stuff. And a lot of people go to large, large corporations to buy their clothes or buy their shoes or buy their food. You know, they go to Safeway. They go to Ross Dress for Less. And, um, and we really need to find new ways to meet our needs locally because when we go and we purchase from these big corporations, it's kind of like putting our money on a truck that's going to leave our communities and drive over things when they leave. Because even if these companies are in our communities providing jobs, it's not necessarily the kind of jobs that people want. I mean, most people don't aspire to become retail workers when they grow up, especially not retail workers for large large um, grocery stores or large corporations. And, um, and yeah, a lot of that money, the profit that's there leaves our community and goes to whoever um, owns the company or who are the shareholders of that company. Um, and the same thing happens when we invest our money. And the majority of us have our money in, in large banks and mutual funds and stocks. You know, we basically have our money on Wall Street. And again, what we're doing when we put our money there is it's, you know, we're the money is leaving the community, and it's probably not um, really effectively getting reinvested in our own communities. It's getting invested in things that a lot of us wouldn't approve of. Um, and, but what, what I've realized, and I think what a lot of us have realized, when we're using our gray matter, when we're using sort of the problem-solving part of our brain, we realize, well, this business is, as usual, this business of us having jobs for big for-profit companies, buying stuff and investing our money in these other you know, big companies. This is the business as usual, and if we keep doing it, the situation is only going to get worse. And the things that we're afraid of, of ecological destruction, economic crisis, that's only going to get bigger, and it's going to get worse. It's going to trigger our reptilian brains even more. And there will be some of us who just keep up in this cycle of like trying to earn as much money as we can and buy as much as we can. Um, but if, if we're thinking, if we're really thinking about it, we know that that's not going to work. So we have to find something else. And the question becomes, what are the relationships that we can build? What are the agreements that we can make? And what are the organizations that we can form that are going to allow everybody to work and allow everybody to meet their needs? And if we can answer these questions, um, then I think it's really going to help our reptilian brains relax. Like if we have made, if we have built relationships, agreements, and organizations in this society that are going to help meet our needs and ensure that we can all make a productive contribution, then I think that this reptilian brain of ours is going to stop being so triggered all the time and, and allow us to kind of build a much better society. And so, so still, especially I, I want to say like the idea of rethinking the way we work is is probably the scariest of all. Like if we if we lose our jobs, it's, it's really one of the most devastating things that that happens in many people's lives. And so the thing I want to say is that the way that we work, and the way that we consume, and the way that we invest our money. So um, putting it even more concisely, production, consumption, and investment. These three things all need to change at the same time. And if they're not changing at the same time, then, then change is really not going to take place. And I'm going to use the example of bread and how we produce bread, how we buy bread, et cetera, um, as an example. And I, on the handout, and just in case anyone's sort of gotten behind, I'm on the very bottom of page five right now. I have all these logos of bread companies on here. And these are all breads that I ate growing up, you know, Entenmann's and Wonder Bread and Oral Wheat and then Thomas's English Muffins. I'm a huge English Muffin person. Um, and 
you know, and I, I'm embarrassed to think, but I still buy, you know, some of these English muffins, even knowing what I know now about the companies, which is that, you know, when I started to wonder about these companies and where my food was coming from, I found out that all of these different bread brands, they look like they're different companies, but they, they are all actually just two large companies. There's Hostess Brands, which I think a lot of us know is um, entering into bankruptcy right now. There's also Bimbo Bakeries. Um, and these are basically two large corporations that own a vast majority of the bread that a lot of people eat. And uh, what happens when we go, even if we go to a locally owned market and we buy these breads, a portion of the money that we spend on that bread is going to leave the community and go to those large companies. And that money is not necessarily going to come back. So if we spend a dollar on bread, probably you know, 50% of that money is going to remain in our communities and be available for recirculation. But the next time that 50 cents is spent on bread um, from these companies, only 25 cents is going to be left. And so it diminishes the wealth that we have in our communities every time we buy from these two large companies. And so what we want to do instead is make sure that locally that there are lots of options for buying locally produced, locally owned bread. And because if we were to buy bread that is produced locally, um, the money that we spend on that bread is going to stay in our communities. And the next time it gets spent, um, it, if we spend $1 on bread, um, and that dollar gets spent again in our communities, then it becomes worth $2. And when that, that dollar gets spent again, it's $3 and $4. And so it, it actually has the effect of, of multiplying the wealth in our communities rather than diminishing it. So, so buying local is a huge piece of all of this. But there's, there's really a lot more because if, if we just start to picture that lots of new bread companies are going to come out of the woodwork and it's going to be very hard to picture, well, how can these very small local bread companies compete with the really big bread companies? And, um, and to try to picture that they're, they're just going to sort of put themselves out there and try to compete, um, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work in this, in this society because um, we, well, basically we need to sort of think outside the competitive framework, framework and, and make new agreements with each other and make organizations that are that are cooperative in nature that are going to allow these local companies to thrive. So I'm going to talk about what some of those agreements and organizations are. Um, but the one thing I do want to say is that forming agreements and forming organizations is really, that becomes the architecture for an economy. And if we start to make new agreements and organizations with each other, we're really building a new economy. And so the first thing I want to give an example of is the type of an agreement. And that is community-supported enterprise. And I think a lot of people have heard of community-supported agriculture, which in its most pure form is an arrangement where a farmer and a group of consumers make an agreement where the consumers usually purchase a share of the harvest in advance. And they might, for example, give the farmer $500 at the beginning of the planting season. And at the end of the season during harvest, the, all of the Community Supported Agriculture Program members are going to get a share of the harvest. And so what this does is it, it takes a relationship between a producer and a consumer, and, and it, they make an agreement with each other to share a lot of things that producers and consumers don't usually share. So they're sharing the capitalization of the enterprise because the consumer is putting money in up front. They are sharing the profits because the consumer is getting a share based on you know, how well the harvest does. They are also sharing the risk because if it's a bad harvest, the consumer is not going to get um, as good of a, a good of a share of the produce. Sometimes, although this brings up some employment law, labor law problems, um, they share in the work. And community-supported agriculture programs often have their members come out to the farm for a day or two every year and do some volunteer work and get their hands dirty, learn a little bit about farming. Um, community supported enterprise programs often share a lot more information, meaning they're a lot more transparent about how their business runs, about how they spend their money, how they make their money. Uh, and there's also sometimes shared decision making. So the 
the business, the farmer, the producer, whoever they might be, uh, might get the customer's input on major decisions about about where they buy their ingredients or how what what they actually produce and so on. So it's a it's an agreement to share, and I really think that so many more businesses could thrive if the consumers and the producers make agreements like this. This is not a new type of business entity. It's not a new type of organization. It's simply an agreement that we can all make. And the next slide I have this is at the top of page seven. This is actually a map of my my neighborhood, and um, there are in the pink area. This is just a two or three block radius from where I live. There's close to I think it's about 350 households, and in California, and actually about in about um, I can't remember about 35 other states. It's legal now to produce bread in your home and sell it. So we just passed in California a cottage food law um, where you know right now and right now it's illegal to produce most types of food in your home and sell it. But now it is legal to sell to make and sell breads and jams and and basically food products that don't need to be refrigerated, so non-hazardous food items. Um, so in a neighborhood of 300 or 350 households, just in this small area, we, we could actually really, if everybody made, or set the intention or even went further and made an agreement to only buy bread that's produced in our neighborhood, we could actually probably keep two or three cottage food businesses afloat um, just in, in this small area where I live. I kind of did the math on it just based on how much bread I think people eat and how much bread you know each cottage food producer can make, and um, and really like if we if we wanted to make it happen we could instead of buying our breads at the Safeway down the street, um, buying from these large companies we could support three new entrepreneurs in my neighborhood. But it wouldn't really be enough if we just set the intention if we just said hey yeah let's try to buy our bread from these local bread producers. If we did take it that one step further and made an agreement with that bread producer and said, or or multiple bread producers in our neighborhood and said, I am going to buy one loaf of bread from you per week. Um, that bread producer would have the security of knowing that their business is going to work and that it's going to thrive. And what do we as consumers get out of making that kind of agreement? Um, is a little bit of power with regard to the bread and how it's produced, and we and we would probably ask the producer to make an agreement with us um, to do things in a in a way that benefits our community. So buying local grain from local farmers, buying healthy grains, using whole grains, maybe delivering the bread via bicycle rather than having large bread trucks drive through our community. Um, so it's an agreement that we would make with this. The producers. It's an agreement between the producers and consumers that really could be mutually beneficial. But the the important thing that I'm getting at here is we really need agreements because if we just leave it up to chance, like yeah, I'll try to you know get in the habit of supporting this bread producer, and um, I mean people in the end, it's it's probably not going to work if we just sort of leave it to chance and leave it to people's regular everyday buying decisions. I think the agreements though are really going to make it solid and make it work. So that's community supported enterprise. Um, another thing that we can do is, um, and, and using the example of bread again, um, is community finance bread. And um, you know, starting a bread business may or may not be very capital intensive, but a lot of people, especially people who are unemployed right now, if they want to start any kind of business, they're going to need to do it with somebody else's money because a lot of people just don't have savings. And the, the traditional way that a lot of people start businesses, or this is kind of what you get trained if you ever go to business school, they say, well, you find a venture capitalist or an angel investor, and you, and you get a large amount of money from them. But what, that, what, that end, what ends up happening there is that venture capitalist ends up getting a large share of your profits. And what it means is that the rich people in society who invest in other businesses uh, end up becoming richer. And of course we've seen this. We've noticed this whole phenomenon with the 1% is that if, if businesses are financed by people who already have a lot of money, those people are just going to end up having a lot more money. And um, 
And of course, um, the money could potentially, again, be flowing out of our communities because a lot of times those investors are not local. So what we really need to start doing is financing our businesses locally, investing our money locally, and if we start a business, uh, seeking out local investors. And this brings up um, legal hurdles that, um, that are pretty significant because it, you can't just start a business and go out and ask people to make a loan to you or invest in your business because it brings up securities laws and anytime you create a security you need to register it. But a lot of businesses these days are realizing the importance of, of registering securities and jumping through those legal hoops in order to ensure that the business can be locally owned. And, and on this slide I have examples of businesses that have done direct public offerings which allow them to seek uh, investments from the community, the public at large, and that's uh, Workers Diner in New York, the New Orleans Food Cooperative. Um, there's actually one in, in Oakland now, People's Community Market, which is in, um, in a neighborhood of high poverty, West Oakland, uh, which didn't have any grocery stores until recently. It was mostly liquor stores. And, and so they're creating a grocery store, but they wanted to they want to get investments from members of the local community rather than have the wealth leave the community. Um, so, um, so any of us with assets that are being stored in a bank or stored in mutual funds should really start to think about, well, are there opportunities uh, to invest this money locally? And increasingly there are. And there's one other thing that um, I want to mention, which is that this year, or actually last April of 2012, President Obama signed the, signed the Crowdfunding Act, the Crowdfund Act, which was a part of the Jobs Act, which has removed a lot of the legal barriers to local investing. It's going to allow businesses to uh, raise capital uh, by getting lots of small investments from the community at large. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. If I have time, I'll share more of the details. But I want to keep going through these examples of what bread looks like in the new economy if we were rethinking how we, how we start businesses, how we make our livelihoods. Um, and the next example I want to give is how we exchange bread. And I have this little cartoon here which is um, it's me exchanging bread with somebody else and this person is handing me 100 loaves of bread. And um, let's say that we <clears throat> For the most part, when, when we exchange things in society, we use dollars. But a lot of people, because of unemployment, because of where the economy is at right now, just don't have enough dollars to meet all of their needs. And so finding other ways to exchange with each other is incredibly important. And so in this example, there's a picture of me, and I've provided some legal services to somebody, and in exchange, they're giving me 100 loaves of bread. And I do actually barter quite a bit, and it's a wonderful thing. But I will say, if somebody hands me 100 loaves of bread at once, that would be a little bit inconvenient. Um, I would probably have to find 100 friends to help me eat it at that moment. And, um, and so it's not very practical to always barter directly with people. But let's say that bread producer were to give me, instead of 100 loaves of bread, they give me 100 gift certificates. Each one is redeemable for a loaf of bread. Uh, then what I could do throughout the year is go back to that bread producer and redeem them for bread. Or I could do something even more interesting, which is maybe when I go to get a haircut, I could give, my <clears throat> I could give the um, barber uh, 10 certificates for 10 loaves of bread uh, instead of paying him in dollars. <clears throat> and, um, and then he could take those and redeem them for bread, or he could do something different, which is next time he buys something, he could pay somebody in a bread certificate rather than in dollars. And what happens when you take these certificates and they start to flow from one person to another in the community, then they basically become a currency. And the word currency comes from the word current and then flow. And so they become a medium that flows through the community. It's a medium of exchange. And I really think that our economies would be much more stable and businesses would be much better able to get launched and people would be much better able to meet their needs if we found other ways to exchange with each other. And so creating currencies is really quite easy. It's really just sort of putting something into circulation that, um, that people are willing to accept in lieu of dollars. And in this case, the currency is backed by bread because ultimately it can be redeemed for a local loaf of bread 
it, which is the same idea of, of how the U.S. dollar started. Originally, they were redeemable for gold. Right now, they're actually not, at the end of the day, redeemable for anything, but they're very valuable because everybody in society is willing to accept them as a currency. But, but what this shows you is there are so many other ways that we could um, agree to start exchanging with each other. And um, a lot of people actually create certificates. They print money or they pr print things that are intended to be used like dollars. But you can also create a lot of online systems for exchanging. And it does bring up some legal issues that I'm not going to be able to get into, although uh, my organization has a website called barterlaw.org where uh, we've written a lot about the legalities of this. Uh, but another phenomenon that I think is a really wonderful thing is time banking. And um, it's actually time banking has gotten off the ground in other countries a lot more than it has in the United States. Like in Spain, the New York Times recently reported that there are over 275 time banks throughout Spain. And these are basically systems where people can do favors for each other, work for each other, and instead of getting paid in money, they get paid in time dollars. So for every hour they spend, they get a time dollar, a time credit. Um, and they can then use those credits to get help from somebody else. And um, in the Bay Area, I know a handful of people who are using this quite a bit. Um, a lot of time banks are really, in the U.S., are kind of struggling. And I think it's because there's not a critical mass of people right now. But, but I think one of the lessons in that is that we all need to just start using them more to create a critical mass so that these systems can work. Um, so another thing, so I've, I've been sort of talking so far about ways that we transact with each other, which is really, um, this is when I first started, I, I talked about this framework of creating agreements and creating organizations. And really what a lot of this is, is just making new agreements with each other for how we purchase from each other, how we invest in each other's projects, how we exchange with each other. But I'm going to talk a little bit about organizations now. And um, because the structure of our organizations can really dictate how wealth flows in society and how decisions are made. And so going back to the example of bread, we really need to think about the entities that are producing bread, distributing, marketing, selling, purchasing bread. How are those entities going to be structured? Um, because if we structure them like regular businesses, I think the same old thing is going to happen. They could be bought out by large bread companies. Um, and again, the, the wealth of society is going to cont continue to be concentrated in the hands of the same old people. And decisions are going to be made uh, in ways that don't benefit our communities. And, and we have a really good thing happening now, which is that consumers are starting to question a lot more about the companies that they purchase from. And, um, I think the majority of people have not really yet gotten there, but we, we see this a lot, which is that it used to be that the bottom line for most consumers is they wanted to get good food and they wanted it to be cheap. And the bottom line for most companies is they just wanted to make money. And attitudes are definitely changing, and consumers are looking for companies that are incorporating multiple bottom lines into their business, you know, being businesses that care about the health of the local community, uh, that care about the health of their workers and creating living wages and the health of the local ecosystems and so on. Um, and I will, if I have time, talk a little bit about new types of business entities that build into the legal structure of the company some of these other bottom lines. But really at the end of the day, when, when we look at, well, what are the businesses that, what, what is the entity structure that is most going to ensure that our communities are protected, and what is going to most ensure that the wealth in society uh, becomes distributed more equitably. I keep coming back to the answer of cooperatives. Cooperatives, cooperatives, cooperatives. And I, I, when I start to think about all kinds of businesses in society and enterprises and projects and assets, I really think that cooperatives are going to be the most economically and ecologically sustainable solution. And so I'm giving the example of a bread cooperative. And if somebody says, well, I'm going to start a bread cooperative, that could actually mean many different things. Uh, it could mean they could be talking about a producer cooperative. And what a producer cooperative usually is, is uh, a, a group of multiple, in the case of bread, it will be multiple bread producers. And as I mentioned, it's now legal in many states to produce bread in, in your home and sell it. And um, 
what a producer cooperative is, is potentially a group of many home-based bread producers who come together and they cooperate to sell their products. And so they might share a stand at the farmer's market or they might share a van that's used to pick up the, the bread and distribute it to multiple stores. Um, and so through that they're able to sort of leverage the power of, of numbers. Um, and it makes them better able to compete with larger companies. So the producer cooperatives are groups, it's a cooperative of multiple small producers. Oh, if a bread cooperative is a worker cooperative, that means that the members of the cooperative are all employed by a bakery. So there's probably one bakery location and the owners of it are the people who work there. And then a consumer cooperative is a group of people who buy bread. Perhaps they're people who are looking to get a good deal on really high quality bread. Um, so they form a cooperative and they say, okay, we're going to support these bread producers. We're going to buy a large amount of bread and then distribute it amongst ourselves at cost. Um, so, and how do cooperatives, there, there are really two major things that, that differentiate a cooperative from a regular corporation. Sometimes there's three. Um, and so first of all, an inherent thing about a cooperative is that the members govern it democratically on a one member, one vote basis. And so it doesn't mean that all decisions are made by all members. But it, in most cases it means that there's a board of directors that is elected by all the members on a one member, one vote basis. So somebody who put more money into the cooperative doesn't get a larger vote. Um, so money doesn't equal power. Um, and, and what it means to me, even though a board of directors may be governing the cooperative, at the end of the day, if the members feel like the cooperative is not making decisions in their interest, they can elect a new board. So the ultimate power is in the hands of the members. And I think if, if we want businesses in our society to operate in ways that benefit ecosystems, that benefit workers, that benefit consumers, that benefit farmers, the only way to absolutely ensure that those companies are going to be benefiting those stakeholders is to make the stakeholders themselves um, in control, is to put those stakeholders in control and give them the ultimate power. So that's one thing that's really critical um, when it comes to cooperatives. Another thing is how profits are distributed. And this is very different from a regular business because um, so in the, the example of a worker cooperative, if, if the bakery cooperative has $50,000 in profit at the end of the year, instead of going to somebody who owns that business, instead of going to typical corporate shareholders, that money gets distributed back to the workers, not equally, not on the basis of how much money each worker put in to the business, but on the basis of the value of work that each one contributed. So usually that's measured by the number of hours that a worker put in, or it's measured by their salary because some people do consider the time of some workers to be more valuable than others. But basically what people are being rewarded for is their actual contribution. They're not being rewarded for being wealthy already and for putting money into it. They're, rewarded, they're being rewarded for working. And so really what cooperatives do is take the money that traditionally goes back to the hands of people who are wealthy and puts it into the hands of the people who are actually doing the work. Or in the, in the case of a consumer cooperative, it, the money gets distributed back to consumers on the basis of how much they uh, purchased from the cooperative. So if you are a member, a member of a grocery cooperative, a lot of times you will get a dividend at the end of the year that is on the basis of how much you purchased in comparison to what other people purchased. And then with producer cooperatives, so if multiple bread producers are selling bread to a cooperative, they get a distribution on the basis of how much they sold to the cooperative. And there's, there's one other characteristic of cooperatives that um, this is not always the case, but most of the time this is true of cooperatives. And I think depending on how you read the law, uh, cooperatives have a special tax status. Um, so if you, want, if you want to meet that tax status or qualify for that tax status, you actually the IRS says you need to be distributing profits back to people on a cooperative basis, so on the basis of the value or the quantity of business that they've done with a cooperative. And what a lot of people interpret that to mean is that if the business itself is sold at a profit, so if, this, if a worker cooperative, for example, 
uh, start the bread company. And if some large company comes along later and says, we want to buy your bread company and swallow it up into ours, the current workers are not necessarily all going to have a huge windfall because what the bylaws of a lot of cooperatives say is that if that bread company is purchased for say a million dollars, then that is going to be distributed among the current workers and the past workers, people who aren't working there anymore, on the basis of how long or how much each of them work for the cooperative. So if you have a bread company that's been in existence for 20 years, then if that, business, if that business is sold, the wealth is going to be distributed among everybody who's worked there on the basis of how much they work there. So it means that the people who are lucky enough to be um, member workers of the cooperative when it's sold are not going to get a huge windfall. In fact, many of them might get a very small payout. So what it does is it creates a disincentive basically to sell the business because no single person is going to get really rich. And it, it helps to ensure that not only that wealth is distributed more equitably, but it also just helps to ensure that these enterprises remain institutions in our local communities. And um, they're not just sold and the work is not outsourced and so on. Um, the, their purpose is to provide jobs or to provide sustenance to people in our communities. And so they're not just going to be bought and sold or outsourced like regular businesses. So cooperatives. Um, I'm a huge fan of cooperatives. And, and increasingly in my law practice, I, if, if somebody is trying to start a really large business um, that's going to, to earn a lot of money, for the most part I, I'm not that interested in representing them anymore unless they're going to be forming as a cooperative because I just think that's just so pivotal to the health, pivotal to the health of our economy. Um, and you know, as somebody who really likes English muffins and who still occasionally sneaks out to the store and buys Thomas's English muffins, if I do ask myself, well, where would I rather get my English muffins? Uh, from an entity that is formed for the sole purpose of providing livelihoods or providing sustenance in my community, or do I want to buy it from a, an entity that's designed to grow really big and get a few people rich and then sell out to a giant corporation? Um, of course I want to get my food from cooperatives. And I hope that all of us as consumers start to look around at the businesses in our local communities. And if there are cooperatives, I think we should really prioritize supporting those cooperatives as much as possible. And if there are more people who are that committed to buying from cooperatives, it's going to help a lot of new cooperatives get off the ground. Um, another, I'm at the bottom of page 9 on the handouts now. I also have a slide about agricultural land trust because um, in connection to bread, um, we also need to think about well, what is the land that is producing the grain? How is that land managed? Um, and if it's owned by traditional, if it's owned by individuals or if the land is owned by traditional for-profit companies, there's a huge incentive to sell that land and to develop it or to put um, housing developments on it. And, um, but if we as communities are, all take part in local land trusts, um, a lot of times land trusts are structured so that can just regular members of the community at large can be members. Um, I think we all have a role to play in ensuring that the land that, is, that ultimately produces the food that we eat is, is managed for the benefit of our communities and for the benefit of the long-term health of our food system. So I just want to encourage everybody to be more aware of land trusts, to take part in them, um, and to, if, if you are a business owner or a farmer, to consider uh, putting your land into a land trust to ensure its sustainability. Um, so just a, a major reminder um, is that production, consumption, and investment all need to change at the same time. Because I think a lot of us as consumers are, are willing to start changing the way the decisions we make about where we put our money and how we buy things. Uh, but I think a lot of us would should really start to consider making the leap into new ways of making our livelihoods. And to do that, we can, we can ensure that we are going to be supported if we are forming agreements and forming organizations with other people in our communities that are going to help to make that happen. And sort of at the, the top of page 10, I, I, I have this sort of four-part framework for how we're going to start to make this change. And there are sort of four levels of how we can build this sharing economy. And at the first level, uh, we're basically um, 
building connections and building relationships to people in kind of casual, informal, and spontaneous ways um, to start to meet our needs. So it's things like borrowing a car or letting somebody sleep on their cou our couch if they um, if they've been evicted. It's sort of just like casual favors that we do for each other, um, lending somebody a vacuum cleaner, that kind of thing. Um, but I really think if we all adopted an attitude that we're going to just do this so much more, not only are we going to give more to people, but we are going to ask more of other people. Sometimes it's a harder thing for me to ask a favor from other people than it is for me to offer a favor. Um, but if we could kind of break down these barriers between people and provide for each other a whole lot more. Um, the currency that we use in providing for each other is not dollars, but it's generosity, it's gratitude, it's caring, it's social expectation. And, and it's sort of like this, it's this cutting edge new economic system known as community. And if we all start to do this a whole lot more, that really can, can help to give us all insurance, assurances that we are going to thrive and that we're going to provide for each other. And I think the most insidious thing about our economy now is that companies have really encouraged us to try to buy everything that we need, to own everything we need, to fill our homes with you know, everything we could possibly ever use so that we don't have to rely on other people. And it's really gotten us out of the habit of relying on each other. It's removed our habits of mutual aid. But we really need to start getting back to that and really embrace it as a more healthy way to live. But at the second level, this is where agreements come in because we can't always rely on these spontaneous things to help meet our needs. Um, it's agreements to collectively purchase things with each other so the, or to form a, a community supported enterprise or to support a community supported enterprise. So making these kinds of agreements that we can rely on. Um, making agreements to regularly share our car, making agreements to um, exchange childcare because agreements are solid things. And I think we, we are all going to become parties to many more agreements. And I think we should all um, start to embrace the art uh, and the joy of making agreements. And, and agreements are, in many cases, because we want them to be something that we can rely on, in many cases they are going to be uh, enforceable contracts. Legally speaking, anytime two people, two or more people make an agreement where they are each going to give something. Um, that becomes a legally enforceable contract. And, and a lot of times people picture contracts as these things with small print that we can't understand, or they are things that we sign without reading. But the agreements that we make in the sharing economy are really going to be like roadmaps to our new relationships. And, um, and in that respect, we should all really have a hand in, in creating them and, and to saying what is going to go into them. Um, and to recognize that this is potentially an agreement that is going to govern an ongoing relationship where everybody is going to be contributing something important. And, um, and I think if, if we can all get into um, the frame of mind of really embracing that we are going to make more agreements with each other, uh, that would be great. And at the third level, we form organizations. And the, the important thing about organizations um, is that unlike agreements, Agreements can often be just between two people, but an organization is an, it's an institution that endures even when one or two individuals come and go from it. So they become lasting institutions in our communities. And I'm talking about forming organizations like time banks, or car sharing clubs, co-housing communities, food cooperatives. And the more that we form these in all of our communities, even as people who are kind of mobile, a lot of people move around from community to community, we can feel a lot more confidence that we can move to a new community and that we are going to be able to join such an organization and help meet our needs. And really the structure of these organizations is so important because um, if we design our organizations to be more equitable and cooperative, then that really becomes the it, it really is that is where the architecture of our economies will be living is in the architecture of organizations. And I think I'm going to stop soon because I did want to leave time for um, questions. And I, I had sort of put a lot of slides in here not knowing quite how long it would take me to go through all of them, but um, quite a long time. But the, I, I've talked a little bit about cooperatives. I do also want to mention just a little bit about nonprofit organizations because um, in many cases if something is not necessarily best 
are not well suited to be a cooperative, being a nonprofit corporation is kind of the next best thing. Because um, what's the basic um, essence of a nonprofit is that um, it's a corporation usually where the assets of the corporation cannot be distributed out to private individuals. And that, that very fact means that the, the entity is not going to be operating for the profit of one individual or one or more individuals. And the decisions about how that organization operates is not going to, are not going to be driven by how much money somebody is going to make. And I think that's a really important thing uh, for how our organizations run is that they not be driven by money, but they, driv they be driven by whatever purpose they have. And what I have is, um, are some slides about different types of tax exemption, um, which uh, the slides are pretty information dense, so you will probably get a lot just out of reading them. But um, the one thing I want to say is that 501c3 nonprofits are not necessarily um, the category of tax exemption that is going to really hold the sharing economy because 501c3s are quite limited in the kinds of activities they can do. And they really, if I have some slides about these sort of gray areas between different realms of life. If you have a 501c3 that's doing a lot of commercial activity like growing food and selling it, um, that's often unacceptable to the IRS. It's sort of blurring the realm of commercial activity and charitable activity. Um, but also, if you have a nonprofit organization that's growing a lot of food and the volunteers are eating a lot of it, it's starting to blur the line between personal benefit and charitable activity, which again is not very acceptable. But I think what we want in a more sustainable economy is something that, that really is right in between all of that, where uh, we have projects that are going to feed us and our communities, they're going to generate an income, they're going to make the world a better place. And legally speaking, it's hard to find the right tax exemption category for that. But what I have are some information about other categories of tax exemption like 501c7, 501c8. Um, they're kind of interesting. Um, the IR, it, what the IRS has decided to give tax exemption to or what, what our government has decided to give tax exemption to kind of tells a lot about um, what we value in society. and. Um, so anyways, have a look at it. But I think these other types of nonprofits are going to be uh, in the sharing economy a lot more um, a lot more common. I also give a little information in the handout about the new kinds of entities like benefit corporations, flexible purpose corporations, uh, which are they're they're great in many ways because it, it helps to ensure that businesses are building in social and economic uh, or ecological goals into their business. I'm not a huge, huge fan because I have to say these entities are still designed uh, to get people rich or they're, they're kind of controlled like typical for-profit businesses. Um, and, um, and I'm just too big of a fan of cooperatives to really want to encourage many people to form them. But, um, and then finally, I was, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the legal gray areas that come up. But um, see, somewhere in here, if you're very interested in the legal issues that come up around cooperatives, around community supported enterprise, I have a new book um, published by the American Bar Association. And um, there's a discount code you can use to um, get 50% off. I put that at the, in the middle of page 16. And um, there's that. Plus, um, I don't have a link to it in here, but there's a, a talk that I recently gave at Lewis and Clark Law School that includes a lot of cartoons, and it's about the legal issues that come up in the new economy. And you can kind of you can Google that, or you can find it on the website of the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And the very last slides are it's that four-level framework I gave, and I, I only talked through the first three so far. Um, the first level is kind of building relationships and kind of providing for each other in casual ways. The second is making agreements. The third is forming organizations. The fourth is actually building sharing economies really into the infrastructure of our society, like having citywide car sharing programs and tool lending libraries, but also really having universal systems of provision. And really, uh, I do want to emphasize the importance of, of things like universal health care and social security and education because it, if we have all these things, if we, have, uh, if we begin to build a sharing economy at the first, second, third, and fourth levels, then 
instead of that, that typical response that we have of wanting to just hoard wealth and hoard assets out of fear of what the future is going to bring us, I think that our reptilian brains are really going to be so much more relaxed because we're going to look at the society around us and look at our future and know that there are so many ways in which we can be provided for and so many ways that we can make a productive contribution. And so my last slide is a picture of our reptilian brain just kind of chilling out and enjoying a cup of tea. And, um, and I think that we really need to get to that place where we can all feel a lot more relaxed and confident that our needs are going to be met. And, and really, if we remember nothing else from this talk, I think that the way that we're going to get there is by building relationships with each other, making agreements, and creating the organizations where all of this is going to take place. And really, if we do all those things, that alone is a new economy. We can completely recreate the economy through the agreements and the organizations that we build with each other. And, um, and that's all I have to say, and, and I would love to open it up for a discussion at this point. Well, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. I can see we might want to have another <laughs> session with you on sort of organizational structures because all those sure. slides at the end look really interesting as well. So, wow, what a wealth of information you are. I'm so grateful you're doing what you're doing. And I wanted to let people know how they can ask questions or give comments. So you can press 1 on your keypad, and I'll see that on a screen here. So if you have a comment or a question, go okay. ahead and press 1, and um, I'll call on you. And we have Janice Lynn. Uh, go ahead, Janice. Hi, Janelle. Um, Hi. I'm in Fort Collins, and um, I that's Colorado, and I'm starting mm -hmm. a time bank. And um, hey. I'm I'm going to be actively involved, probably in uh, well uh, with a kitchen cabinet, um, and hopefully creating structures around uh, making agreements, but not necessarily being involved in the agreements themselves because that's just too time intensive. But one of mm -hmm. the things I would like to do uh, besides making one-on-one -on -one agreements is uh, possibly create creating kind of little co-ops or cooperative groups within the time bank. Mm. Um, so what, what do you have to say about the feasibility of doing that within a time bank? Mm. I think that's a great idea because, because I, you know, one thing I've noticed about time banks is that a lot of them are having a really hard time building a critical mass. And I think part of that is because there are people out there who want to build community, they want to cooperate with each other, but they're not necessarily interested in accumulating time dollars. Um, and that's actually the case with me personally because I, um, you know, I could provide legal services to people through a time bank uh, and accumulate time dollars if I wanted to, but um, you know, I actually just do it for free a lot of the time anyways, and it builds up goodwill and community, and people do favors for me. And so in many ways, a lot of us are kind of building a gift economy independent of a time bank. But if there were a structure where I could come together with a group of people and uh, start to really consciously think about other agreements I could be making, agreements to share a car, agreements to collectively purchase food from a farmer, or agreements to form a food co-op, that would be a whole lot more appealing and useful to me. And I think if a time bank serves as the location where people are coming together to do that, uh, it will probably get a lot more people using the time bank as well. Um, so, and, and it's, I think that you're really onto something with the idea of, of creating these structures or kind of helping people form these agreements because individually it's very hard to start reaching out to just whatever random people in our neighborhood or in our circle of friends to say, hey, I want to start making some agreements or start doing some collective buying or something like that. Uh, but if you're with a group of people who've come together for that purpose, um, I think that you can really get a lot done. Thank you. Sure. Great. Um, great question. And we have one from Ellen uh, Morf Morphy. Oops, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing your name right. <laughs> no, you got it right, which is rare. So, oh, uh, good. Good. <laughs> um, Janelle, would you? I'm um, working with a group of people. Uh, to develop a veterinary co-op. As far as we know, it's 
would be the first of its kind. And we're struggling with many of these organizational issues that you were starting to present. Um, a lot of our things squarely um, can be 501c3 able, if I can make up a mm -hmm. word. Um, but we very much like our structure to be to be a cooperative and, and for that to be employee owned. But we're trying to get up to speed on a lot of these issues before we um, seek professional counsel. I was hoping that one thing that you would say again the um, presentation you made recently that you thought might give a good overview, as well as just some of the places you might recommend getting that education a little bit more before we do um, get professional consultation. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, so first of all, the the um, presentation I had mentioned. I think if you Google Lewis, I see, and Clark, and then Janelle Orsi, you'll probably come to a link to my presentation. Uh, okay. Maybe not. Or you'll come I'm to do that while we're talking, right? Yeah, yeah, it's up there. So there's that. Um, our organization, the Sustainable Economies Law Center, has also created something else you might be interested in, which is a website called cooplaw.org. Yep, and, I've seen it. Uh, okay, good. So co-op with a dash, um, okay. cooplaw.org, uh, which has a little bit more information about the legalities of cooperatives. And um, let's see, you know. There are, every now and then there are professions, uh, because of the rules that govern a profession, and this is true of lawyers in fact, and I, it might be true of certain medical professions, um, that pre actually prevent people from forming cooperatives, that the profession itself dictates what type of business entity you can form. But, so I don't know if that's true of veterinarians, but one thing that I have in the slideshow that I didn't get to talk about um, is a slide that talks about the fact that cooperatives Cooperatives in most states are a type of corporation. Um, mm -hmm. So let me see, it's the slide on page 12 in the middle. Cooperatives are present as um, legal entities. So a cooperative corporation is, um, is a corporation that builds the one member, one vote into it, and also a lot of times limits the way that profits can be distributed, um, ensuring that it's on a cooperative basis. Um, but you know, you can take a lot of other types of legal entities and structure them like a cooperative um, through the operating documents, um, through the, the bylaws of the operating agreement basically, where you adopt the, the cooperative legal structure of democratic governance and the way that the profits are distributed. And so, um, so that might be, depending on what type of entity you ultimately form, just something you can do is really build in the cooperative. Um, Principles and values into the entity. Um, let's see. Was there another part of your question that I haven't answered? Um, no, I think you have answered my question. Yeah. Um, some overviews, some places to look for more information, and a little more information to find your presentation. Yeah, great. Well, and good for you for considering forming a cooperative. I love to hear it. We're lucky uh, in our area to have a lot of well-developed sharing things, a successful time bank, and a lot of other things, and it's kind of infectious. So we're, oh, we're really? happy to be taking it to the next level. Yeah. What community is that? This is Media Pennsylvania. We're part of Transition Town Media. It's a transition organization. Oh, great. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, we have a, a, a few more questions. We might be able to mm -hmm. get uh, through them before we, we close for today. So the next one is from Cecile Andrews. Mm -hmm. Hi, Cecile. Hi. Um, I think it's so incredibly important. You and I were on a conference together, and yeah, I remember. Got me so excited, right? It got me so excited because what we're really trying to do is bring about a broad cultural change in which people feel they're connected and they care about each other, and that ultimately it's about sharing wealth. So I'm always trying to figure out how do we reach out to the people who are. You know, they're just kind of close, but they are skeptical. It's like really how to build the movement that doesn't scare people because people seem so scared. It's kind of what you said in the beginning of anything new. So, yeah. you know, how do you reach out to the people who are just, just on the edge of coming yeah. in? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, actually, I'd love to put that back to you, Cecile, because I know that you've put a lot of thought into this and have written quite a bit about it. <laughs> Do you have any ideas? Because you know this this really is a hard thing. Um, I think it, it's it is mandating a cultural shift, 
And, you know, a lot of times I'll say things like, well, potlucks, you know, just anything you could do to break the ice with people, um, getting together more, starting to do more little things to provide for each other, or even big things, you know, lending people your car. I, one thing I've suggested is um, to start sharing in ways that might surprise people. Like I share my guitar, I'll lend out my guitar to people, my travel guitar, and, or I'll lend out my car. And um, a lot of things, you know, lot, these are things that a lot of people might not want to share because they worry about losing them. Or, but, um, but when we make these big gestures, I think it makes an impression on people. That, yeah, do you have any thoughts? Well, I think what you're saying is really true that we start with these little, you know, talking to people and, and then they begin to see that we're nice people and then we can mm -hmm. kind of slip in, <laughs> slip into the conversation about these bigger ideas. But that that really it is important to have these little things, having people over, talking about things you're interested in. Stop and chat when we're out talking and out walking. So mm -hmm. um, and I think what you're doing, and particularly you showed us today, is it's very positive and so social change focuses on the negative and it scares people. And I think you pointed out a lot of what we're doing is because we're scared. And if we can make people feel safer and you know, more accepted, then that's part of it. So yes, I think that level one that you described is really important. So thank you, thank you. And, I'm, and tell us about what you, you said you have a new book. Yeah, that's Practicing Law in the Sharing Economy. And it's published by the American Bar Association. And, um, and it really just focuses on a variety of areas of law that come up as we try to build more sharing economies. So what are, how do we choose the organizational structure? What employment law issues come up? What securities law issues come up? And I have to say, a lot of issues come up because our whole society has been designed for a much more competitive type of economy or much more unequal economy. And uh, the sharing economy is really about putting ownership back in the hands of everyone. So, and you have a new book too. I'd love, I'd love for you to mention that real quickly. Right? Oh, that's it, it, it's it's Living Room Revolution, a handbook for conversation, community, and the common good. So it really is about, you know, your level one. We've got to get mm -hmm. together to talk, and then yeah. and then we start talking about the big things. After you talk about the little things, like. You know, go for a walk with your dog. People stop and talk to you, and then you can tell them about the sharing economy. So mm -hmm. it's kind of subversive conversation is what we're practicing. So, yeah. so thank you. That was great. I really enjoyed it. So, um, thank you so much. it was um, great to have it. Thanks. Bye bye. Awesome. Bye bye. Uh, we have another one. I think this might be from a group. Um, is there a group with you, Rains Cohen? Yeah. 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 Hi, um, Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So I was I was curious. Um, there's a lot of online communities and uh, social tools for sharing for the sharing economy um, that are kind of centralized in different places in the United States. Um, are there any that you could recommend? We're in the Bay Area, by the way. Um, we're yeah. actually in Oakland right now. Um, are there any that you yeah. could recommend? Yeah, actually, well, so there are thousands of websites that are now designed to help people share. And people call it the collaborative consumption movement or the peer-to-peer -peer economy. And it's things that help you lend your car to a stranger or have a stranger stay at your house and have them pay you. And there are actually there are two websites that I feel like probably we should all get on. Because um, I, I think that these websites are kind of limited to the extent that I don't think they're going to be the, base, the full basis for a sharing economy because it's about strangers. And I think what we want to do is build community with people around us who we know or are going to get right. to know. Right. But there's one that I love, and it's called nextdoor.com. And it creates a social network for your neighborhood. And I'm on it, and that's, um, that's where I got that sort of map of about 300 um, uh, households in my local neighborhood. And we put things on that um, that we're interested in borrowing or lending or sharing or we organize little coffee gatherings and potlucks and that type of thing um, using that website. So that's nextdoor.com. And then another one I'm really enjoying is yerdle.com, Y-E-R-D-L-E, -E, where you can post things that you're interested in giving away or lending out or that you would like to borrow. And so it's a, it's a great way to, if there's something that you need rather than buying it, I actually recommend going on Yertle and looking in to see 
who's there. And there's one thing that differentiates Yertle between um, in comparison to a lot of other similar websites. Because I will say there are a lot of sites that help you do this now. But um, Yertle only shows, for the most part, only shows you uh, people lending stuff or borrowing stuff if they're your Facebook friends or if they're friends of your Facebook friends. So mm. I offered to lend out my guitar to um, to whoever, but whoever ends up borrowing it is either going to be my Facebook friend or a friend of a friend, which means that there's a little bit of a connection there, and we could mm. we could talk and be like, oh, how do you know Bob or you know. So it's not a complete stranger, and I really like that. I feel more motivated to, to share with people who I have some sort of existing social connection with. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Do you have any? No, oh, sure. Oh, I, oh, well, I was just wondering, um, we have two more questions, and we're kind of out of time. So how would you like to handle those, Janelle? Did you want to? I'm, hap I'm happy to answer them, and people can hang up okay. if they need to go. And yeah. OK, let's go to Abe. Um, Abe, you're on with your question. Then we have Lila or Leela after. That'll be it All right. for today. Yeah, registered us for All right. Um, I have two different initiatives I have questions about. One is I'm starting a income sharing community, a, a um, 501D in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and um, just wondered if if we. I know how we we eternal, internally will work, you know, in terms of the legalities. But when we start bartering with other businesses, organizations, and individuals? Are there any kind of um, legal considerations we have to do that uh, we have to think about? Like if we were giving produce to a um, healthcare provider for services, for, as an example. Mm -hmm. Well, that, I guess that, one important, yeah. One important thing to remember about barter, regardless of what type of entity you are, um, is that most of the time the IRS is going to consider that to be taxable income. And that, that's complicated because then you have to give a dollar value to things that you're exchanging without using dollars. Um, so it makes, you, it makes you do everything with reference to the U.S. dollar economy. It's a pain. It also means you have to pay taxes with dollars that you may not have ever even received. Um, so, so it has to be on the it has to be on the in the paperwork in U.S. dollars, basically. Yeah, yeah. You can't okay. send the IRS produce, unfortunately. And <laughs> I wish I wish things were different. It's actually not a far cry to say that people should be able to pay their taxes in some sort of in kind thing by by doing some sort of community service. I think, in my opinion, people should be able to pay barter taxes by doing community services because obviously they wouldn't have received any dollars with which to pay the taxes. So. But yes. Well, that would be something to advocate for. The other, the other thing is I'm working with um, some other parents where we're starting an unschooling cooperative mm, where right. we'll work like a free school where the, where the um, students and the, and the staff, the parents, um, run the co-op um, democratically. Right. Um, but, we, but we also, it, because we are small and we haven't had, and um, we need to make income, um, we, we're also talking about um, having um, w shifts where we t have shifts where we're watching the children for the cooperative for that cooperative, and have a um, business where we're taking shifts, um, making money in that business at the same. Um, so mm. we switch, like you know, back room homeschooling, front, front room running the business to make uh, money and to run, you know, to bring in income for the cooperative. Um, mm -hmm. Just wondered if that should that be? And it's it's a little co it's a little complicated to get like to, for me to try to figure out what that means um, in terms of incorporation. Like, mm -hmm. um, should that be two different entities, or is, can that all go under a cooperative mm -hmm. corporation? Yeah. Well, you know, well, first of all, I want to say I just I love hearing about all these creative things that people are doing, and that just sounds like a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, and the question of what type of corporation you should form and what type of tax exemption you can get is probably something you need to ask a local attorney about. But I will say that most child care cooperatives or educational cooperatives are eligible for 501c3 status. Um, even though they're co called a cooperative in name, I will say the majority of them are 501c3s. But when you incorporate a business component, of course, there's a risk that the IRS is going to consider that to be um, unrelated business income. And you don't want to have too much of that. Um, so that's something you might want to kind of talk to a local 
lawyer about, but um, that even when you provide child care or you provide um, education in exchange for dollars, that still might work under a 501c3. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, last question from Leela. Yeah, hi. Or Layla. Hello. I got it wrong. Layla, hi. Layla, okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, thank you so much for offering this call um, or webinar. I wanted to ask a question. It's been on my mind a little while. I'm a I'm a self-professed foodie and farmers market groupie, and I don't know what you want to call it, but I've been interested in opening kind of a closed door restaurant in my backyard um, and kind of featuring neighborhood produce and local produce, and then you know maybe doing a spin-off of that that pops up at different locales where they're open to having me do a dinner in there you know, cafe that's only open in the morning and they want me to do a dinner type of thing. And I'm just wondering what are the legal considerations um, for something like that. I know I can do it underground, but mm -hmm. I kind of want to do it so that it will last and, you know, be yeah. fruitful for me and others. Yeah, gosh, I really wish we could live in a world where so many more people can do that, especially when it comes to food. I think, gosh, it would be incredible if people could have little restaurants in their homes or in their backyards or just to do this occasionally. Or, um, yeah, I just, I, I don't, yeah, I feel like I'm not as much a producer or a baker as much as I'm a chef, and mm -hmm. so that's where I fit in, but, you know, maybe it's a hybrid of those two things. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. well, I will say that what you're describing brings up more legal issues than many other things in the sharing economy. <laughs> because, uh -huh. um, and because basically any time you start to do something that looks like a food business, it triggers health and safety laws. And health and safety laws generally mandate that you have a very specific type of kitchen with specific types of kitchen equipment and specific types of plumbing, et cetera. It also brings up the zoning laws because in our residential communities, we're very limited in the types of businesses that we can operate, especially uh, businesses that involve visitors um, are generally limited. Um, and then um, I think those are the big ones, but your homeowners association, if there is one, is not necessarily going to be pleased. Your homeowners insurance is probably going to reject the coverage of such an activity. And, um, and uh, so it, bring, it does bring up a lot of barriers. I did write an article, though, that you could Google. It's called The Shareable Food Movement Meets the Law. And it is about the kind of legal gray area between having a dinner party and operating a restaurant in your home mm -hmm. and how you might be able to kind of frame it as a private, non-commercial activity. So right. That's on share, like shareable. a club. Yeah. Right. Like a, what's it called? Shareable? Shareable.net is where the article is. And the article is called The Shareable Food Movement Meets the Law. Great. Yeah. Good luck with that. Thank you so much, Janelle. Um, you got through all the You're questions welcome. and just so much material. And just wanted to see if you have any closing thoughts. And then I'd like to open it up for everyone to sign off with um, comments or thank yous or hollers or something as they go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, um, any closing comments? No. Well, I guess well maybe two things actually. Uh, one is it, it's all it's just great to hear about the kind of projects that people talk about when I do these these kinds of um, talks or these webinars. Um, it, people just have so many creative ideas and I, I love it. And I hope that those of you who are doing cool things like a child care cooperative or a backyard food business that you, you know, share the information about what you're doing and how you're doing it and inspire other people to replicate it. So like write articles about it, and, uh, et cetera. But also um, I was I didn't realize how long it would take me to talk through everything I wanted to talk about. And I'm, I am a little sad I didn't talk more about legal structure because what I realized also about this group is a lot of you are members of transition towns or leaders in transition um, groups and that there are a lot of groups that spin off from that. And probably all of you at some point are part of an organization or a group that's asking yourself what type of legal entity should you form and how should you structure it. And, um, Anyways, I'm, I'm sad I didn't get to talk about that more. People can get a little bit from my slides, but I'm definitely happy to do another talk someday just about that. Yeah, I, I think that would be great to do another one, Janelle, if you're, yeah. if you're available for that. That would be wonderful. Sure. You and I can schedule it. And mm -hmm. Yay.